All right, can you believe it? We're here on Thursday night. It's been three weeks since we last met on Thursday night. I was beginning to wonder if we were, if the Lord was telling us something and to cancel Thursday night class, but no, he wasn't telling us that, which is good. But tonight we're going to start in 2 Peter chapter 3, which has some very interesting things in it that have been driving me nuts the last few weeks trying to read a tremendous amount and work my way through this because there's a few little problems. So we'll get to that eventually, but not tonight, probably not next week, but after that we will. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Before we get started this evening, let's uh, take a few moments. We'll have silent prayer so we can all uh, make sure that we are spiritually prepared to uh, study the word today and to or tonight, and to get into it and learn what the Lord is reminding us about tonight. So we'll focus on that, but we'll have a few moments of silent prayer. So if you need to, you can confess in, make sure you're spiritually ready to study the word, worship the Lord as we study his word tonight. Let's pray. Father, it is so great that we have the freedom to come together this evening to focus upon you, to be reminded of who you are, which is so much part of this epistle, to be reminded that there we live in the midst of a spiritual battle, a spiritual war where Satan seeks to blind us to the truth, blind the unbeliever's mind to the gospel, and Father, we live in a world that seeks to uh, eliminate Christianity and eliminate the Jews. And Father, we pray that you would just watch over us in this time that we might be prepared spiritually to face whatever may come our way. And Father, we know that our mission is not to be comfortable Our mission is not to be successful in the eyes of the world, but our mission is to be ambassadors from the high court of heaven to the fallen world that is in the grip of uh, of Satan. And Father, we pray that we might be faithful witnesses during our time here. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, I'm fiddling with my phone for a reason. I um, took some notes today because yesterday I got a phone call from a friend of mine, and he said, um, would you be interested in going to a small private non-fundraising luncheon tomorrow with Mike Pompeo? And I said, sure, that sounds pretty interesting. And so I did that. There were 12 of us today. We uh, went out to a very nice restaurant, and we... Uh, got a chance to ask him questions for about an hour along with eating. I don't think he quite made it into even a third of his salad because he was answering all, all of the questions. And my basic takeaway from it was that that uh, in terms of all of the questions, I didn't really learn but a few little facts that were that were new, but the general broad tenor of, of things just confirmed what most of us suspect is true and really going on uh, in government. I got there a little bit early, and there were about maybe six or seven other men there, none of whom I knew. And uh, um, so uh, we were just getting to know each other and everything when he came in with a couple of of people uh, who were taking care of him. And it was 
really interesting. He um, had a sport coat on, open collar shirt, and walked over to one group and uh, introduced himself to them. And and uh, then he and I didn't hear any of that. And then he came over to me and he said, uh, "Hi, I'm Mike. Just call me Mike." Everybody's called me Mike most of my life, so so no no formality or anything like that. And he just seemed like a uh, just a down to earth individual. You know, if you don't know much about him, he was the uh, valedictorian of his class from the United States Military Academy at West Point. He was he served uh, got out of the army as as a captain and then he went into politics. He was originally from Southern California where he went through high school, and then he he when he got out of the army he started a company, and lived in Kansas and was elected to Congress from uh, a district in Kansas, and then as things progressed he was uh, uh, the he was appointed by. Uh, Trump, I believe, initially to be the director of the CIA, and then um, he was uh, appointed to uh, be Secretary of State for the last two and a half years of Trump's administration. The Washington Post, thinking they were committing an insult, said that he was the most loyal of Trump's cabinet uh, to him. Trump called him up on the phone to tell him that. He said, Mr. President, don't take that as a compliment. They are in, trying to insult me by saying that. Anyway, he was, um, when he came in, he came over and introduced himself to me, and I had taken a book with me. I took Vody Bauckham's recent book called Fault Lines, The Coming Crisis in the Evangelical Church which in my opinion, if you're going to read one book to try to get an understanding of uh, the critical social justice worldview and understand uh, critical race theory and Black Lives Matter, or cancel culture, and all of these things that are going on, the Marxism, the communism, everything that's happening, then this is the book for you to read. Uh, some of you may not know who Vody Bauckham is. He gives his testimony in the book, which is quite impressive. Uh, he is uh, a black pastor. He went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, but he was uh, not reared in a Christian home. His mother was a Buddhist, and uh, she, I think, she got pregnant. I may be confused on some of my facts. She got pregnant when she was living in Midland and decided to take all the other kids and, and while she was pregnant and go to L.A., and I think that's where Vody was born, and he grew up in the projects in South Central Los Angeles. And he t gives his testimony because so often when he takes his positions, then his critics say, well, you've never had the black experience. So he gives his testimony because he wants people to know that there's no box left unchecked in terms of his black experience. His uh, great-great-grandparents on, on both sides were slaves in, uh, in America, and he grew up in a single-parent home. His mom was single, had kids from, I think, different fathers, and he grew up in poverty in South Central uh, Los Angeles. But he had one thing that would get him out of the ghetto, and that was his ability to play sports and play football. And he got a football scholarship, and he went to New Mexico State University. And uh, one of the uh, men there who targeted him was the director of ca the Campus Crusade for Christ uh, campus ministry. And it wasn't long before Vody became a Christian. Uh, he played ball there for a couple of years and tr was able to transfer his scholarship to Rice, came here to Houston, and he was here in Houston for many years. Uh, uh, did not finish at Rice. He transferred because he saw that the Lord was taking him into the ministry, and he went to Houston Baptist University and uh, graduated from there. Then he eventually went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, came back to Houston, had a church for a number of years. I heard his name the first time when I first moved back to Houston because he was a speaker at the College of Biblical Studies banquet that year. He is very articulate. If you want to understand some of these issues, just go to YouTube, and if you search on his name, V as in Victor, O-D-D-I-E, and then last name is B-A-U-C-H-A-M, 
you will find a, tr a number of videos on um, Marxism, <coughs> on biblical justice versus social justice. I like one of the phrases that he uses. Uh, if you are uh, sympathetic to because they sound good, these names sound good, like Black Lives Matter and, and uh, social justice, uh, they are not what you think they are. And you have to understand exactly what they are. And so he has, uh, he has spoken quite a bit on this, and he's caught a tremendous amount of uh, flack from the uh, uh, black, woke, Marxist community. And uh, you may not realize the NAACP was founded by Marxists as well. And so that is endemic in a lot of the so-called black culture. And um, he came to a realization uh, sometime after he got out of seminary, because he has a picture of himself in there where he's got a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X and some other uh, black leader. And he said, I was really into it. And then one day I realized I had, to, uh, based on Romans 12 too, that I could not be conformed to black culture. I needed to be conformed to the culture that is in Christ. And that wipes out all racial distinctions. And so he's got quite a testimony, and then he goes through and documents heavy, lots of footnotes, lots of good documentation in this book called Fault Lines. So I handed that to Pompeo, and he looked at it and he went, I know that name. He said, you know, I think somebody else gave me this book. And I got the impression that he just sort of, well, that's nice, you know, he's probably given a lot of books and it goes somewhere. And so I went through a little bit of what I just described to, to y'all and explained uh, his background. He's a missionary now. He moved his family a number of years ago over to Zambia, and he is, teaches in a seminary in Zambia, comes to the U.S. on speaking engagements. Um, anyway, so I went through this with, with Mike, and he said, I'm definitely going to, uh, going to read this. And then we had our luncheon, and he talked and everything. And at the end of the luncheon, he, he sought me out, had the book, and said, can you put your name and church and phone number in here? Because um, I'd like to have that. So uh, that's how it went. Now, what were some of the things that he covered? He was asked a lot of questions. He was asked questions about Iran. He was asked questions about Turkey. Uh, he... Um, uh, he was, in the course of that conversation, he talked about how the CIA and the Mossad worked well together during the Trump administration, but as of the morning of January 20th, the Mossad stepped back because they don't know what they're going to get. There's no one, he said, there were no uh, comments, he said there's not one person working in the White House they, they, they say they're pro-Israel, some of them, but there's not one person in the White House who has ever stepped up to do the right thing or, or, or do the right thing by Israel in their entire careers. Not one person that has acted as if they were pro-Israel. Uh, pro uh, regarding Turkey, he said, um, of course, the leader of Turkey is Erdogan, and he is... Uh, seems to have a lot of power lust, but he, there's a huge disconnect between the Turkish government and uh, the people. The people, he say, you go to Turkey and the people just love Westerners, they love Americans, they're, they're, they're not radicals at all, but he is. And so he said the, the main thing is we just have to hope that we can survive the Erdogan era because we need Turkey, so we need to keep working it and keep trying to keep and do what we can to keep it isolated. He we talked also about uh, Russia and their things that they're doing in Ukraine and in Syria and that, that the Biden administration really doesn't have a clue as to what, uh, what, they're, um, what they're doing. There was uh, one question about North Korea and uh, he said, it's, he said the, I don't know if you know, know this from the news, but uh, Kim Jong, I can't keep getting him confused. Kim Jong Un, is that the one that's there? Kim Jong Un is, um, 
he's young and he's very, very unhealthy. And so he, there was nothing was heard from him for about 10 days within the last couple of months. So there's a lot of rumors floating around. He said, no, he's, he's, he's alive, he's there, but he's just so unhealthy. He said, even though he's young, his implication was because he's young, he's probably going to be able to survive for a while, even though he is so, uh, so unhealthy. And then uh, there were a lot of questions about China and uh, the influence that China has in this country. China has poured a tremendous amount of money into this country. They have sent a lot of their people in through illegal channels. They have, um, they have put a tremendous amount of money behind uh, scholarships behind uh, university chairs. The Muslims have done the same thing, uh, which gives them a huge foothold and influence uh, on these universities, on wh what is taught, what is not taught, things of that nature. And so that, that they're turning several universities into basically ch uh, Chinese propaganda. And one thing he said that I thought was interesting, that, that uh, a lot of American films get uh, uh, exported, shown in China, but they are not the versions that we see. They are modified and they become basically propaganda for China uh, when when they're shown in China. So those were just some some of the high points. We didn't talk about the Israeli election or some other things, but um, there were a lot of uh, it was very very interesting, very laid back conversation, and he was a uh, very personable. I've been around a number of politicians. He did not comport himself like a politician, which was interesting. He didn't have that air about him that he was somebody, and he was just very relaxed. I have been told on the way over there, I had a conversation with, uh, with Tommy Ice and his son, who were driving down to... to um, uh, Texas for going to a conference that was going to be all about exposing woke Marxism and everything else. And um, so, but his son David was really up on Pompeo and says he tweets all the time. Every Sunday, he tweets out some Bible verses and and gives you know some biblical information. It seems very uh, committed as a conservative on the conservative end of the evangelical spectrum. So uh, he's clearly someone who knows the gospel, believes the gospel, and trusts in the Lord. So that was, that was uh, good to understand all of those things. All right, let's open our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And tonight we're going to look at the importance of reminders, the importance of being reminded again and again of the basic truths of Scripture that it, we don't forget. Because our sin nature, I think, works over time to help us forget what we've learned in Scripture. So just a review, there are three basic divisions in Second Peter. They follow the chapter divisions. The first chapter focused on God's will is for us to grow to spiritual maturity. God's will is not just that we simply be saved, but that we grow to spiritual maturity. The second division is God warning us about false teachers, and we just concluded that in our last lesson. That's all of chapter 2. And then all of chapter 3, God is refuting specific false teaching related to the future coming uh, the future return of Christ, and that's in the first 14 verses of the chapter. And then the last part of the chapter, 15 through 18, are the uh, concluding remarks focusing on 318, that we are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what we have in chapter 3 is basically uh, the two divisions under in verses 1 through 14, the first is Peter's second reminder, that is in uh, the first two verses. And then the second is verses 3 through 14, where God refutes the false teacher's denial that there will be a literal second advent. 
that, there will, that Christ is not going to come, therefore there's no future judgment. Everything just happens and continues on the same uh, spectrum without any, uh, any change. And so don't expect Jesus to be coming, coming back. So that is part of the uh, thinking of the, of the false teachers. So he introduces us to this reminder in verses 1 and 2. He says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. That, here's the purpose for this second epistle, that you may be mindful We'll get into how that should be translated better. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So this focuses on on reminder. So we'll begin by looking at this first verse. He addresses them as beloved uh, John does the same thing. This is based on the uh, noun for love. It is the word agapetoi in, in the Greek, and it is a term of endearment from him who was their teacher and had ministered to them in person and now writing this second epistle. And most people believe that the first epistle that is the uh, epistle to uh, the, the first epistle that he wrote, and that this one is following up on that first epistle. And so he says that he is writing this to stir up your minds, your pure minds, by way of reminder. So the focal point here is this concept of, uh, of reminder, because you have... Uh, in the beginning of the second verse, the purpose, uh, uh, an infinitive of purpose, actually, that you may be mindful, which is probably translated better, in order that you may be reminded of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophet. So he's not talking about reminding them of what he said, but reminding them of what was written uh, in the scripture. So this is a, this first word is the word hupamnesis. Uh, some, some of you have used this term that when you're trying to memorize things, you will use a mnemonic device. Well, that word mnemonic is from the root of this word. It has a uh, prefix here. Uh, it's only used three times in, uh, in the New Testament. But it basically has the sense of remembering something. Paul used it in uh, 2 Timothy 1.5, and then Peter uses it twice in this epistle. In uh, 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul is writing to Timothy. It's his last letter. It is uh, not long before he will go to be with the Lord through uh, decapitation by the Roman government. And he writes to Timothy, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, or in other words, when I am reminded or when I remember of your faith, the faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Then in Second uh, Peter 1, 1 um, 13, Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. That's what Peter said at the beginning of this epistle. So you've got the, the body of the epistle is bracketed by two statements that relate to being reminded of something. And then in 2 Peter 3, 1, we have the statement that I have just read to stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So this is um, important for us to understand why it is emphasized in Scripture to be reminded and to remember. And there are so many passages that emphasize this because it is so easy for us to forget. And this sort of goes along with what we studied 
on a Tuesday night in, in Judges where the Israelites forgot God. That is a willful forgetting, a willful disdain, a willful act of setting God aside and ignoring everything that God has done so that we can go about our own way. And the essence in that, whether it's us personally or whether it was Israel, is that we want to re rewrite the reality of history and make up our own narrative, make up our own idea. And we just see this so much in our culture today where people just want to make things up about what happened in their lives. They, there's no objective reality anymore. People are divorced from reality because they are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, as Paul puts it, in, in Romans, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 1. So as we get into uh, this passage, uh, I want to remind us of what we saw earlier in 2 Peter 1.12, where Peter said, therefore, I will not neglect to remind you constantly uh, about these things or to remind you always of these things. See, that's the idea there, that in order to be a good teacher, you have to constantly remind people about things. And that brings into focus this idea of repetition. And it's not just uh, you, where you always say the same thing over and over again. You say it in different ways. And you use lots of different um, ways of communicating, whether you're using, using visuals and charts, things of that nature. Having grown up um, under Pastor Theme's ministry, I will probably never, even if I get Alzheimer's, which runs in the family, um, I will probably never forget the essence box. You know, our, our, the circles of our position in Christ and our fellowship, those, those will probably never be lost. And that is because there was a constant repetition, but not in a way that it seemed that he was just saying the same thing over and over again. So 2 Peter 1.12 focuses on this. John 14.26 Jesus told the apostles. Now, this is important because this is a verse. There are some verses in John 14, 15, and 16 where you're not sure, is Jesus talking just to those 11 in front of him? Or is he talking to us through the 11 who are in front of him? And it's real easy for people to take verses out of context there and apply them to all Christians when they clearly only relate to the, uh, the disciples. And other sections, for example, when he's talking about abiding in him, that applies to all believers and not just to, uh, not just to the disciples. But in John 14, 26, he's talking about the role of the Holy Spirit when he comes. And he says, but the helper, and the word there is paraclete, the comforter, the encourager, the, the one who strengthens us, I think would be a very good way to uh, understand that idea in parakletos. It's, if you broke it down etym etymologically, it means someone who's called alongside to, to, or comes alongside to help. Uh, but I, I think in light of that prayer that we studied recently in Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul prays that the Holy Spirit uh, would strengthen us in might, that that is in the inner man, that that is the idea of the role of the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. He is the one whose role is to strengthen us spiritually. But here he says when the paraclete, the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Lord will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now to understand the reference of the second person plural pronoun there, the word you, you have to look at that last phrase, that all the things that I said to you. Jesus didn't say any of these things directly to any of us. 
So it's really clear there that he is talking only to the 11, the things that he taught them during the three plus years of his ministry on the earth. He taught them many things and he, uh, he said numerous things. And now when they have to write these things down, uh, when Matthew and John are going to be writing these things down and Peter's going to be writing some things down and saying some things in Acts, that the Holy Spirit is going to remind them of what the Lord taught them so that it's not up to their faulty human memory to try to uh, recall those things. So we see that the Holy Spirit... Uh, I think it's legitimate to apply this way that if the Holy Spirit can bring to remembrance the things that Christ taught to them as they're going to write Scripture, then when we have learned the Word, that it is God the Holy Spirit who communicated the Word, it is God the Holy Spirit who preserved the Word, it is God the Holy Spirit who, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, who helps us to understand the Word, then we could apply this and say God the Holy Spirit is going to remind us of the things that we have learned as we have studied the Word when we, we need to use them. I think that's a legitimate application. Remember, there's one, only one interpretation but there may be more than one application of a verse. And so I think that we can learn from this that the Holy Spirit works uh, on the memory uh, for them. And for us, it would be a little bit different because Jesus never directly taught us anything. But we have learned uh, the word. And so he, it's stored in our soul and he helps us to remember those things and to apply them. In 2 Timothy 2.14, Timothy is challenged by Paul to remind his congregation of the things that Paul has been uh, teaching Timothy. He says, remind them of these things, uh, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of, of hearers. So they're constantly being reminded of the things that we're to do, the things that we're to focus on in our spiritual life and in our spiritual growth. That we have to, um, that we have to be reminded again and again and again of just the, just the basics. I often think that, that all of Scripture for the, for the life of the believer can be boiled down to the basic words in, in that hymn, Trust and Obey that that just captures it all in two words. Of course, there's more to it, but that if you were going to summarize the spiritual life, it's trust. We have to know the Word. You can't believe not in something you don't know. You have to know the Word in order to believe it and in order to trust in the Word. And then you have to obey the Word and do what it says, uh, it says to do. You don't just mouth the platitude that... Uh, we do what the Bible says to do and then go talk about psychology or human um, works and be a motivational speaker and never talk about the Bible again. Uh, you have to actually understand it, trust it, and obey that which you have trusted. In Titus 3.1, Paul tells Titus, "...remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities." to obey, to be ready for every good work. So you have one area where apparently there were some problems with some rulers, governors in Crete, that might have been uh, perceived as unfair or unjust, and they are told you are to be subject to rulers and authorities, even if you don't think they're doing the right thing, uh, to be ready for every good work. And then in Jude 5, verse 5, Jude writes, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, see, they have to be reminded because they've forgotten something that they were taught, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. 
So in that verse, what we see is that they knew this, so they have forgotten this, and perhaps there are some Jewish believers in that audience, and because the focus is on remembering uh, what the Lord did in saving the people in the land of Egypt. And that's interesting because if you go back and you read in Exodus and in Deuteronomy and in the Psalms, that is a major theme, is to remember what the Lord did in delivering uh, the Israelites from bondage in Egypt. And that's, that's the whole purpose of the, of the Passover, is to remember uh, what God did to deliver them uh, from bondage in Egypt. So this is very important. We have to, as pastors, we have to remind people of the basics over and over again. I remember uh, some some years ago talking to with a uh, basketball player, college basketball player, and I said, what's the most common, common mistake that basketball players make? And he said, they forget the basics. He said, a lot of people get all caught up in all kinds of fancy dribbles and passing and all kinds of fancy maneuvers and everything. But if you forget the basics, it, it's, it doesn't matter how sophisticated your moves are, you're not going to win. You just have to stick, uh, stick with the basics. So we have to be reminded of the basics. We have to remember the foundations of the faith. We have to remember the, uh, the things that are taught again and again in Scripture. When you get into the latter parts of the Old Testament, uh, there are reminders of what? Of creation. God is the one who created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that is in them. You have to be reminded of that. There's reminders of God's call of Abraham. There's reminders of God's judgments. Judgment at the flood, judgment at Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, there's reminders of God's grace and his deliverance at numerous occasions. And they're referencing back to especially uh, what happened at the Exodus, but also the victories that God gave uh, Israel in the, um, in the conquest. So these things are, are key pegs that all of Scripture hangs on. So that's why uh, many years ago, 40-some-odd years ago, Charlie Clough decided that, that what really needed to be done to teach people the framework of the Scripture was to look at these key events and what is suspended from those pe memory pegs, as it were. And a lot of doctrine throughout the scriptures are tied to specific space-time events where uh, God uh, judged at the time of Noah, God judged at the Tower of Babel, God called Abram and made a covenant with Abram, and then uh, set other events as you go through the Old Testament. And they all tie together. You can't just pick and choose what events you uh, you like, and the way most people learn the Bible is just, it's just sort of helter-skelter, scattered. They get this Bible story and that Bible story, and they don't see how they're all integrated uh, together and how uh, they provide uh, sort of covering fire, if you want to use a military analogy, for one another so that that they, they, they intersect and they're interdependent, and if you take away one, you have to take away all of them. And that's why Genesis 1 through 11 is under so much attack today, and has been for the last 250 years, it is because everything else in the Bible from Genesis 12 to Revelation 22 is built on the foundation of Genesis 1 to 11. And if you destroy the historicity of Genesis 1 to 11, then the rest of the Bible has no legs to stand on. And so liberals have been attacking the literal creation view, the young earth view, all of these different views for 250 plus years in order to destroy confidence, uh, confidence in the Bible. So ha we have to be reminded of these things over and over and over and learning, if you think about the things that you have learned in life, that learning is the result of repetition. 
the repetition of certain words and certain phrases over and over again so that you can remember them. The repetition of verses. Uh, as I start every class by quoting a group of verses, and I have for the last 20 years, the reason I started doing that was because I heard Charlie Clough tell a story one time about a man, this was when he was pastor in Lubbock back in the early 70s, he pastored there from about 68 to 80, somewhere in there. And he had a man in his congregation who had come out of Houston, come out of Baraka, and had flown B-52 bombers. He was flying on the very first uh, bombing run over North Vietnam. And he was telling Charlie, he said, we're, we're up there and there's a t there is a strategy to how they fly in formation, why they are, the uh, bombers are set up in the formation they're set up in so that they can provide covering fire for those that are on their wings, those above and those below. And so as they're getting into North Vietnam territory, they start running into a lot of anti-aircraft fire. And the whole discipline is you don't break ranks. You don't break your formation. You stay together because that's how everybody is protected. And once you're, you start hitting all of this anti-aircraft uh, fire. The, the uh, jets are bucking like wild broncos and you're, everything, you know, fear wants to take over and, you, and the guy was saying you just want to grab and fly and try, try to dodge these, uh, the incoming rounds, which of course is foolishness. And he said, as, as I'm struggling with this, all of a sudden I, I heard the voice of Pastor Theme reciting uh, verses uh, from the pulpit. And I thought, wow, that's a great story. And I know as much as I encourage you and have encouraged others to memorize scripture that we're all under the same pressure of, of, um, of, of time and it seems to get worse and worse every five or ten years. And so by my memorizing these verses and repeating them over and over again and I see people lip syncing with me as I say them, that's good, I'm accomplishing my purpose. You've memorized those verses. And so that's important. That's how we, we learn things. And a couple of examples, if you are in music, if you're involved as a musician, and when I was growing up, I played piano, and when I was in um, junior high, I started playing trombone in the band, and I carried that through uh, at least till I graduated uh, from high school. And when you're learning an instrument, whether it's piano or guitar, or whatever it is, you have to learn certain basic techniques and you practice those technique exercises over and over again. So it just gets into muscle memory and you don't have to conscientiously think about every movement that you're making, whether you're talking about the uh, movements, the, the, the valves on a, let's say, a trumpet or a baritone or sousaphone or something like that, or the, uh, the fingering on a woodwind um, clarinet or, or a saxophone, baritone, um, bassoon, something like that. And so you practice these things over and over again. I remember in high school, I'd always take a study hour and would go to the band hall and would practice because to get our grades, we had to pass certain levels of technique exercises. Most boring thing in the world. But you've got the same thing if you're in athletics. You're going out and you're just practicing tackles and practicing tackles or practicing blocking or or running and things of that nature. Basketball, you're just shooting free throws over and over and over again, or you're practicing different runs up on the basket and, and, and shooting hoops. But it gets those the, the, gets it into muscle memory. If you're in things like, like dance, you have to learn all the precise movements and you have to practice them over and over and over again. And that gets it into your, into your muscle memory. And it's all repetition. And you do the same thing when you're memorizing scripture. You're just, you get that scripture, you're memorizing it, and you just, what, what do you do? You repeat it out loud. I repeat it phrase by phrase, out loud, over, over, and over again. Um, I brought with me tonight a book that I got. In fact, I pulled it off the shelf. I hadn't looked at it in a while, and there's the 
uh, sales order in the back. I bought this at the end of my first year of seminary. It's called, uh, it's written by John Milton uh, Gregory, and it's called The Seven Laws of Teaching. This is an old classic, and it always was highly recommended in, um, in, in ev every class. But he goes through and he outlines these uh, seven laws of teaching. And each chapter has uh, 15, 20 pages explaining all the different parts. You have the law of the teacher, the law of the learner, the law of the language, the law of the lesson, the law of the teaching process, the law of the learning process, and then lastly, the law of review and application. And I was looking at that as I um, came, came to the end here, and I noticed he had several things to say about review. Now, review is just reminding you of what you've already been taught. And he has... 12 different statements about the law of review. Consider reviews are always in order. Second, have set times for review. At the beginning of each period, review briefly the preceding lesson. At the close of each lesson, glance backward at the ground that you've covered. That's the third point. Fourth point, after five or six lessons or at the close of a topic, take a review from the beginning. Um, the best teachers give about one third of each period to purpose of review. Uh, they then thus they make haste slowly but progress surely and he goes on 12 different points and we used to kid and joke about it what are the seven laws of teaching repeat 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 and repeat so that's that's the key because that is that is how we learn and so we see this in scripture we look at the various uh, commands of Scripture. Exodus 13.3, Moses told the people to observe Passover. And he said, remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be e eaten. He's giving the instructions for the Passover, which is all about remembrance. Uh, Exodus 28, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Numbers 15, uh, 38. Uh, this is very, uh, very interesting. It's the law of the tassels, the uh, talit, that are on the bottom of the robes of the, of, uh, of the prayer cloth. Not the robes, but the bottom of the prayer cloth. Uh, he's, in Numbers 15, 38, and 39 Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord. You know, 613 commandments in the Mosaic Law. And that was the idea, is to memorize them and each tassel would represent another uh, commandment. And, and that you may uh, remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. These are some of the commandments. In Deuteronomy 5.15 and 15.15, 16.12, it says, Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy 7.15, remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh. Deuteronomy 8.2, you shall remember that the Lord your God led. At Deuteronomy 8.18 and 19, which is what I have here on the slide, notice this contrast for those of you who were here Tuesday night in Judges. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this, de this day. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God. So you have remember, but if you forget, then this is what's going to happen. If you forget, and what does it mean to forget? You are disdaining God. You are willfully choosing to ignore what he has done, uh, to tell yourself he really hasn't done that, and I don't need God. Um, what will happen if you do that and you follow other gods and serve them and worship them, worship them? I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. 
It's a great background verse from what we studied Tuesday night in, um, in Judges. And then you have other passages such as Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots. You know what the word for chariot is in Hebrew? It's Merkava. Merkava is the name of their most advanced tanks. So you don't trust in your armament. Don't doesn't mean don't have it. It's that's it doesn't matter. When God's on your side, then you're gonna have the victory. And if God is not on your side, then it doesn't matter how efficient you are. It doesn't matter how uh, superior your strategy and tactics are. It doesn't matter how superior your weaponry is. You're going to lose. But if God is on your side, uh, you need to do the best you can with your equipment. But the victory goes to the Lord. And so that is important in many areas in, in life that ultimately we need to recognize we're trusting in the Lord. We're not trusting in, necessary, in politics. That doesn't mean you don't get involved. But we know that the ultimate solution and issue is, is God and that he's the one who's going to give the victory and he's the one who is going to protect us. So David wrote some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And that doesn't mean, oh, what's his name? Oh, yeah, it's, it's Yahweh. That does, that's not what it means. It's to remember who he is because the name reflects his essence. It relate, relates to who God is. So we're going to remember who God is in terms of his omnipotence, in terms of his, in terms of his revelation and the plans and purposes that he has for Israel and we will remember who God is because God is the one who can give us uh, the victory. And then uh, last but certainly not least in terms of all the passages of Scripture talking about remembrance, we have what the Lord says at the Seder meal, the Passover meal that he celebrated with his disciples the night before he went to the cross. He said to do this in remembrance of him. And so it's interesting, if you do a study of memory... And the Hebrew word for memory and the concept of memory, it isn't just simply recalling something to mind. That's how we think of memory. And we all have little glitches and we can't recall somebody's name or something like that. But that's not what this means. In Hebrew, the idea of memory is to remember something toward the end of doing what was said to be done. Okay, remembrance isn't just sort of an academic recall. It is doing what you're supposed to do, carrying out the, the, the will of the Lord. So when the Lord says, do this in remembrance of me, that word remembrance incorporates everything that the Lord had taught them and who Jesus Christ is in terms of his person and what he did in terms of his work on the cross and that that should transform uh, your life, transform the way you think about, uh, uh, about your life. And so this is all packed, this is all part of the baggage that uh, was present when Peter is talking about that he will not be negligent to remind uh, them. So we, I've just put some different uh, translations up here. Uh, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you. That's the New King James. Second Peter 1.12 says, Therefore, I will always remind you about these things. That's the Holman Christian, um, should be the Holman Christian uh, Standard Bible. And then Second uh, Peter 1.12, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you. Notice the difference between the NASB. I'll be ready to remind you. And the uh, Holman Christian, I will always remind you, and uh, second, in the New King James, it's that idea. That's the primary idea is I'm going to remind you. It's not uh, the New American Standard that I'll be ready to remind you. He's more uh, definitive than that. So just a few principles. First of all, reminders or repetition uh, is designed to help us all learn. 
To ha- that's how we learn. And the purpose for the local church is, is a place of learning. It is not a place where we're going, and we do, uh, we're going to come to a place of learning, and as a side note, we're going to develop some friendships, and we're going to enjoy uh, some of the people that we meet in the local church, but not necessarily every one of them. The purpose for college, for you know, going to university, is not a social life. That it may be forgotten by a lot of incoming freshmen. The purpose for going to university is to learn something. But most people who go to university not only learn something, but they meet a lot of other people and they have a great social life. Uh, Some of them too great and they don't learn so much. But uh, the purpose of a local church is not social life. That's a side benefit. The purpose is to learn the Word of God. Second thing is that teaching should not be toward the goal of remembering, but it should be toward the goal that we cannot forget it. There's a huge difference between saying, I'm going to put this together so you can remember it, and saying, I'm going to do this over and over and over again until you cannot forget it. Typical homiletics in modern seminaries and churches and probably going back a uh, hundred years or more is the idea to make it memorable. So they'll have three points. That's it. You're not going to remember eight or ten points. But you, maybe you'll remember three points tomorrow afternoon. And by the next day, uh, you might remember one of them, and then by Sunday, well, I think we did something on Second Peter on Thursday night. But if you go over the principles in the Word again and again and again and again until people are, uh, uh, eyes are starting to glaze over, then they can't forget it. It's been drilled into them. And that's a huge difference in philosophy of ministry. And so many churches, that's, uh, that's what the pastor does. I remember a black pastor that I was working with some years ago said, well, well, we were taught that you never should repeat anything that you did in your sermon the week before. And you're, you, people aren't going to learn. It's not going to transform their lives under that, that principle. That's one of the reasons the evangelical church is in such trouble. Third, through repetition, we develop the ability to retain the information and to later recall it for use. Of course, we understand that's all done through the uh, Holy Spirit's ministry to us. And just for an example of this, one of my favorite passages is Lamentations chapter 3, verses 20 to 26. Now, what's interesting here, and I think I'm going to stop here in Lamentations. It's a good place uh, for us to stop. But Lamentations, as we get into uh, looking at Lamentations and this, this particular chapter, what is going on in the first part of the chapter is that, that Je- Jeremiah is just depressed. He is overwhelmed by the destruction of Jerusalem, and uh, he's focusing on his problems, on his afflictions. In verse 1 he says, I'm the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his, that is God's wrath. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. I mean, it's just, woe is me. Everything is just so horrible. Uh, Surely he has turned his hand against me. It's all God's fault. God has brought all this about, and everything is, is horrible, and I'm physically depleted. He's aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He's besieged me, and he just goes on like that until you get to verse 20. In verse 20, he's still depressed. He said, my soul still remembers. But what? what's the response? And it sinks within me. I'm depressed. I remember what the Babylonians did. They burned the temple. They killed so many people. And then he shifts in verse 21. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. There's no hope in the first 20 verses of the chapter. 
But now he recalls something. What does he recall? He recalls who God is. He recalls God's faith faithfulness. He recalls God's mercies. He recalls that God is in control. He says, this I recall to mind, and therefore I have confidence, a confident expectation. That's what hope is. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. We're still alive. God still has a plan and a purpose for my life. Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so he moves from being despondent to being optimistic, to having hope, to focusing on the Lord. He says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. But all this starts because he starts recalling the promises of God, the word of God. He starts recalling the goodness of God in so many ways. So that is why we need reminders. Now we'll come back next time. That's only the first three points. I have uh, three more to go through, and then we have to get into the uh, second verse. So we'll uh, get into that next time. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things this evening, to be reminded of the importance of memory, to be reminded of who you are, to be reminded of your word, to re be reminded of your grace, to re be reminded of those benchmarks in history where you intervened in human history and worked wonders and miracles and provided that which was needed to ultimately lead to the Savior and our salvation. So, Father, we pray that in our own lives we would not forget, we would not willfully disdain you. We would remember and focus on that which you have provided that it might change the direction and focus of our lives. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.